Hello students, welcome to our journey of variety of theatres. Yes, there are three major factors to theatre architecture. One, applicability. Two, soundness. And three, aesthetic element. There have been countless theatre companies all over the world where the culture of theatre has thrived. This form have varied based on their time and location. That variation has been as per the difference in traditions of performance. This leads us to the conclusion that theatre architecture has confirmed to the theatre performance traditions of their time and the audience that related to those traditions. In addition to felicitating performance, theatre architect also represents the cultural achievement of the people of the place where they are situated. This cultural achievement influences design, technique and style. Yet the basic requirement of a theatre hall such as acoustics, visibility and felicitation of actors and audience was never disregarded. For the present day study, only such stage designs have been discussed as has been accorded the highest and the timeless regard by performance traditions. However, this discussion revolves around contemporary relevance. Tradition also evolves, hence the present day study considers original, changed and modern theatre architecture. Theatre architecture, an effort has been made here to provide a brief description of historical origin and the flow of development of theatre architecture. The emergence of ancient theatre in the form of human activity. Little is known about the emergence of theatre activity or other similar activity. Yet, it is a satisfying thought that theatre emerged in the form of human activity simultaneously with human civilization. However, this ritual of ancient theatre has no context for theatre architecture. Yet, the selection of a locale for the right of the performance is an important step in this direction. Circumambulation by the participants in the staged performance ensured definition of the parameters and size of the stage necessary for the performance. Only providing some height to the defined area now remains from the point of view of theatre architecture. The emergence of Greek theatre architecture clarified this. Greek theatre 550 BC to 325 BC. In a basic outline of classical Greek theatre, there was two thirds of a full circle and in the open part of a circle there was a rectangle and a small circle right in the centre. The structure of Dionysus auditorium at Athens in the 5th century BC can be guessed from the archaeological research the remains of the auditorium built in 4th century. The underlying stage requirements in the text of the play and the theatre traditions prevailing over the course of time. The starting point of the development of Dionysius auditorium was the Agora or the main market of the place in the middle of which all kinds of religious and social rituals, political speeches, legal debate and dance and drama took place. From the description available, it seems the Greek theatre emerged from the ritual dance and song wherein some early Greek musical instruments were also used. The dance and song ritual was carried out to please the Greek deity Daonius on festive occasions. The place where the ritual was performed by the early Greek artist was known as orchestra or orchestra. It was this circular place that gave form to the Greek stage or theatre architecture. When the ritual dance and song became specialised, the audience would watch the ritual from outside the circle with a sense of devotion. Legends were included in it over a period of time. These were given the form of chronicles later on. For the sake of definition, 
In the next step, the biographies of the chronicles themselves were presented in the form of a song, dance and dialogue. With that, their stage shifted from Agora to southern incline of the Acropolis. The Mount Acropolis was a kind of a natural auditorium where the citizens of Athens sat under open sky without a disturbance every year in March to watch the drama competition that took place during the festival of Dionysius also known as the city Dionysia. This was the early form of theater or theatron which means a place for watching. This mountainside auditorium was in the shape of a horseshoe or the letter U and surrounded about two thirds of orchestra. On the slope of the mountain, backless benches were arranged in U-shaped row with second and third row behind it for audience to sit. The auditorium was much like modern stacked open theatres. The wealthy and the influential of the city, administrative authorities and priests would sit in the front rows. The front rows were known as pro -ideria. It is estimated that Dionysius Auditorium could seat about 12,000 to 15,000 persons or spectators. On the two level of the viewers gallery, the upper level used to be semicircular, not in a two-third circle like the lower level. Between these two, there would be a pathway that was known as diazoma. It was similar to the gangway of today. The viewers could reach any row using the step at several locations. The steps were known as climax and were similar to the aisles of today. The step path going toward the viewers gallery and the skein had on both its end two units of rectangular gates. A unit of each gate was known as parados. Each parados was constructed on top of three straight pillars and to connect them there was a horizontal construction. One of these was used by the actors to go from the slope to the stage by means of a soffit and the second was used to go to the viewers gallery and the climax. There were entrances at both ends of the orchestra which was known as paradoi or isodoi. These paths were used by the spectator and the chorus. The chorus would go through the orchestra to its designated spot. For the convenience of the audience, the seats were divided into several zones. The orchestra could be a flat area. It could have been a circle or other shape with an altar called thymel in the center. It was used as a theater property. In the beginning of Oedipus Rex by Sophocles, the citizens of Thespis sit in a pose of surrender in the front portion of the courtyard of the royal palace. When a platform like stage was needed by the main actor, the orchestra was taken over by the chorus. In this manner, the orchestra was a part of the acting field. In the early days, except for orchestra, all other parts of theatre were temporary arrangement. Although formerly there were 12 members in the chorus for the play, it was later increased to 15. Hence, the orchestra must have been large enough to accommodate the chorus along with their instruments and enable them to perform. The orchestra was connected to stage that was known as proscenium or acting place. There is no consensus on how high the proscenium or the stage was from the orchestra. Keeping in mind the conditions of presentation, it seems that it would not have been higher than two or three steps. Although the members of the chorus would never participate in the action, they would maintain constant dialogue with the actors which would pose practical difficulties if the stage were to be higher up than three feet. The remains of the theatre Epidaurus suggests that it was 12 feet high and 6 feet at the Megalopolis Auditorium. However, both these auditoriums are of a later period and the role played by the chorus had undergone a great change. In the orchestra, 
it had now the status of an independent unit. The place where the actors acted or spoke their dialogue was known as legion. The word literally means a speaking place. Behind the stage, there would be a painted wall or wooden building that was known as skein, like a tent or a hut. The wall outside the skein was known as proskenion, which meant something set up before the skein. The proskenion had three tall doors in it, the middle one being taller than the other two flanking. All three doors opened out onto the stage through which the actors came and went. This was the backdrop of the stage and a symbol for a specific place such as a palace, a temple, a mountain, a cave or a seashore. It was also an instrument for activating the audience imagination. Events such as death, murder or war which could not be shown on stage were described in words and the audience would believe that all of that action was taking place in the skein behind. Then the skein was no longer just the backdrop or a symbolic place for action to take place, but became an invisible locale of the play. The skein was also used to store costume, masks and stage properties. The characters in the play would change their costumes and masks there. It was their green room. The actors would speak their dialogue and act in front of the skein. The skein would have also served to transit their voices to the audience. In addition, the roof of the skein could also be put to use. In the classical age, the stage and the pavilion developed at two levels. The platform on the stage was known as the legion, whereas the place above it where actors could act came to be known as Theologian. The later word means a place for the gods to speak. In this manner, the legion represented the mortal world, whereas the theologian represented the immortal world. Many Greek plays ended with divine intervention. The play would reach a point where a particular duality or dilemma could not be resolved, or a deity would appear in the sky and provide direction. To show this device, using a crane or similar contraption, an actor would be shown as being in the sky and he would be set down upon the roof of the skein. The technique was called dex ex machina in Latin, which means God from the machine. In addition to this, the other device used in Greek plays known as ekleama, it was a trolley on wheels used to bring out onto the stage an event taking place behind the stage in the form of a tableau. It was brought through the door in the skein in front of the audience. Roman Theatre 320 to 20 BC Roman Theatre was similar in many ways to the Greek Theatre. Therefore, it can be studied well only in the perspective of Greek Theatre. Before studying Roman Theatre, we should therefore look at the changes to the Greek theatre. On account of political and social reasons, the cultural affinity between the Greeks and the Roman was growing. One after the other, many changes took place and Greek theatre also died out simultaneously. The orchestra became smaller and was reduced to the shape of a semicircle, then skein and theatron were reduced up to the orchestra and the in-between space vanished. Finally, half the skein merged into a small part of the orchestra which resulted in a reduction of the formerly large theatron. The Romans wanted to model their theatres after the Greek manner, but they did not opt for the sides of the mountain for that matter. Instead, they created tall semicircular wall with soffit at two or three levels and supported the viewer's gallery on it. The stage and the platform were elongated and extended right up to the ends of the semicircular viewers gallery. Naturally, the orchestra that joined the stage and the viewers gallery also became semicircular and on account of the reduction in the measurement, the incline of the viewers gallery increased by about 30 degrees. 
Roman theater could not be as large as the Greek theaters using the natural inca incline of the mountain and making a wall to support the viewers gallery are two separate things. The unification of the stage, viewers gallery and semicircular orchestra brought the audience close to the actors. Simultaneously, the radius of the orchestra was also reduced. As a result, the angle of the viewers gallery increased and as the stage wall rose as high as the gallery, the acoustics effect was felicitated in Roman theatre. The stage platform may have been uh, 5 feet taller than the orchestra, but is used, yes, but it used to be very long and was imparted a shine through polishing. The Senecia forms was a high black wall of the stage floor supported by columns. The proscenium was a wall that was supported the front edge of the stage with ornately decorated niches of the sides. The Roman theater had a podium which sometimes supported the columns of the Senecia forms. The Senia was originally not a part of the building itself, constructed only to provide sufficient background for the actors. It was decorated with columns, niche, portioses, projections and statues. The Pardoi of Greek theatre was replaced by two large rooms at the end of the stage which had arches that could be used by the actors for entries and exits. To save the furnished walls and, and the polished flooring from rain, an awing could be used over the stage which inclines toward the back so that the water from the rain would not drench the stage and other object. It seems the stage had a curtain at the front that rose to block the viewer's view of the stage and would be lowered into each slot. The Roman theatre was, was one from the point of view of theatre architecture, but from a practical point of view of the location of the stage, it was not purposeful. In addition to staging plays, it was also used for light entertainment such as dance, short anecdotes with dialogue, mime, prestidigitation, acrobatics and more. Sometimes it was also used for presenting animals, fake or symbolic duels and wars at sea and other such events. During presentation of violent animals, there would be arrangement to protect the audience from attack by the animals, yes. To present war at sea, the orchestra would be filled with water and little ships inserted in it. Elizabethan theatre, 15th to 17th century. Just before the reign of Queen Elizabeth developed dramatic methods and acting traditions transformed into a unified style which we call the dramatic play today. The theatres of the Elizabethan era were booths. Architecturally, the backdrop was created using a simple curtain on the stage. The banquet rooms had customized victory arches that reached the front yard of the inn. These playhouses were square, circular or polygonal. The stage always projected outward with the audience around it. On the edges, on more than two surfaces in stepped rows sat the wealthy class. The conventions of playwriting affected the stage and the acting styles as well. Playwrights would defy the principles of three unities, time, space and action and such plays were possible only with permanent fixtures that represented different places. A public playhouse the theatre was owned by James Burbage, which had to be shifted for many social and political reasons from North Bank of the Thames to the Southern along with many other several public playhouses. The theatre was circular and from one part of the circle a square stage projected out toward the centre. But when it was reconstructed on the Southern Bank, it could not be made circular and it got a polygonal shape and became known as the globe. Its reconstruction was supervised by Shakespeare who also staged his own and other playwrights play in it. 
Some other playhouses built in this period were modeled after the globe, which allows us an estimate of practical and aesthetic facets of the globe. No one knows of the original shape of the globe, but available evidence and context led Adam and Smith to believe it was octagonal when they created a model of the globe. This shape resolves many issues related to seating, viewing, acoustics and acting. The globe was evenly octagonal and its stage was hexagonal which projected out into the front. The front yard would be used by those who spent less to stand and watch the play. Those who spent more money could watch it sitting on step-like benches kept in the gallery. The gallery was constructed around the stage and front. Three sides of evenly octagonal globe were meant for the stage and its users and the other five were reserved for the viewer's gallery. On the bottom surface, every gallery had a floor area of 12 feet and the middle and the upper level galleries protruded 10 inches to the front. The floor of the central part and that of the parts at the ends reached up the middle of the yard to make a hexagon which served as the stage. At the back of this hexagonal stage, there was a curtain and a trapdoor. The curtain and the trapdoor could be shut or open as required. In this manner, this stage served the function of an internal place on the first floor and the audience could see most of it from every seat. At the lower floor, the gallery was four and a half feet high from the ground. The yard was on the incline of nine inches toward the stage from every direction. As a result, from the nearest point of the yard, the stage rose five and a half feet high. On all the three floors of the gallery, every block had one and a half feet high railing on the edge, just as a railing was also found on the edge of the stage. The benches in the gallery had one and a half feet high back. In this manner, the level of the eyes of the seated audience was always above the head of those standing. The incline of the stage and the yard also similarly aided clear view. At the back of the stage floor, there were two door pots decorated in the style of Elizabethan age, which were used for the entry and the exit of the character to and from the palaces described. The second floor of the internal stage was equal to that of the second floor of the gallery. This internal stage on the middle floor projected four feet out to the front. At its end was three feet tall railing to prevent actors from falling off. At the back of the projecting part of the stage, there would be a curtain which would then withdraw, would allow a view of the internal stage as with the stage on the first floor. The block on this first floor toward the side of the projecting part of the stage had two railing with arches. The blocks behind these arches served as additional space for acting. On the floor of the third level of the gallery too, there was a third internal stage which was covered with curtain and had railing for security, but this did not project like the stage on the second floor. Therefore, it may be concluded that the internal stage on the first floor was actually an additional space for acting. The internal stage on the second floor created the effect of internal space and the stage on the third floor made for Carvenius background. In this manner, every floor contributed to and enriched the aesthetics of the presentation. Above the internal stage on the third floor was a roof which was covered two-thirds of the main stage. This roof was supported on two heavy columns rising from the main stage and was known as shade or heaven. It was called shade because it provided shape to the stage on all the three floors and it was called heaven because its internal roof had been engraved with zodiacal signs. On the third floor, there were four huts. Of these, three were adjoining and the fourth was above them. One of them was used to fire guns from. This was a signal for the start of the play. 
It was also used to create the effects to indicate war. The second and the third huts were used for creating sound effect as per the requirement of the situation in the play. The fourth content, yes, the fourth contained contraceptions to lower or raise character using sedan chairs or swing. Sedan chairs or swings were used to bring or take away divine characters and to be to present their business. On the internal stage of every floor, there were rectangular opening which were closed with mobile beams. The door in the floor of the main stage was used for appearances and disappearances of unnatural characters such as ghosts and witches. The globe playhouse measured 82 feet from one end to the other and it could accommodate approximately 3000 viewers. The blocks around the stage aided acoustics and octagonal shape of the theatre aided reflection of the sound. The entire playhouse was built from wooden frames. These wooden frames were joined on the inside with wooden beams and located, yes, and coated with mud and lime on the outside. This ensured that unwanted external sound did not enter the theater. There was also the possibility for sounds to echo in the theater as its internal surface was made of wood and in the yard and the gallery, the audience came dressed in heavy apparels. In this manner, the acoustics of the globe were excellent. Friends and students, hope uh, you have enjoyed this architectural theater journey today. Thank you. Thank you.